and welcome. This is episode 156 of That Shakespeare Life. England, the queen immortalized in woodcuts show her fondness for the sport of hawking. By the time James I comes to the throne in 1603, hawking as a form of hunting for royals has been surpassed in popularity by a form called par force, where animals like dogs and horses are used to round up prey. While the practical aspect of hunting animals for meat was utilized in these hunting expeditions, arguably the primary function of going hunting was to establish yourself as a member of the higher order of social status and to network with powerful political connections that might advance your station. In her paper, He Cannot Be a Gentleman Which Loveth Not Hawking and Hunting, our guest Karen Kaiser Lee writes about the popularity of hunting par force under James I and explores the specific hunting treatises that were written during his reign to both define the methods of hunting as well as regulate what kinds of people were allowed to hunt in this particular way. Karen joins us today to take us inside the world of early modern hunting to look at who was allowed to hunt, what they used when they were hunting par force, and how it helped usher in a new era in English history where a person could move upward in society if they were disciplined enough to learn a new and important skill. Karen Kaiser Lee is an assistant professor and the director of the writing program at St. Xavier University in Chicago, Illinois, where she teaches writing courses such as study of rhetoric and writing in digital environments. She began her study of Renaissance hunting texts as part of her involvement in the Society for Creative Anachronism. Her interest was piqued when the organization began incorporating dog coursing as an activity. Graduate study in rhetoric allowed her to study these historic texts in depth. Her master's thesis describes how Renaissance hunting manuals doubled as instructions to help the nouveau riche of the period enter the upper echelons of society. Her other research projects have included how English travel narratives describe women of other cultures. Karen has presented her research at the International Congress on Medieval Studies. Find out more about Karen and her research in the show notes for today's episode. Hello, Karen. Welcome to the show. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I've seen woodcuts featuring Elizabeth I going hawking, and there always seems to be a great group with her on these endeavors. When royalty went hunting, was it for the practical purpose of of bringing back game? Was that the point, or was this a show for something else? Oh, it was definitely entertainment. Uh, I think the food at the end was a nice bonus that that they could bring home, but the real the real thing was the the production the the activity of hunting. Um, You're absolutely right. There's these fascinating woodcuts of her. There's one I'm thinking of in particular where she's sitting in the ground and it's clearly they're having a picnic and it's actually a picnic before the hunt. Um, She uh, did enjoy hunting. She did a a hunting type of hunting called bow and stable where basically she would be on a platform and they would drive the game in front of her and she would casually shoot at the deer while she had musicians playing and her courtiers waiting on her. It's, uh, it it seems so different than what I think of, or when I first started thinking about hunting, Uh, it's, it's definitely an entertainment. Um, Lots of people involved. You had a lot of uh, huntsmen and and again, courtiers uh, attending her. Uh, It was, it was, it was fun. It was a party. James I introduced a specific kind of hunting called par force to England during his reign. Karen, how was par force hunting different from what England had seen Queen Elizabeth do previously, for example? No, he didn't actually introduce par force hunting. Uh, That had been around for quite a long time. It it came to, uh, it's like European high medieval hunting. Um, A lot of the terms are French, so we assume that a lot of the stuff came from the continent, from France. Um, So when when I described uh, Elizabeth Bowen's stable hunting, where they just kind of drove the game in front of her, um, he was mainly into par force hunting, which meant hunting through force of dogs. So he would get up, uh, bring his courtiers with him, bring a bunch of dogs, and they'd go out into the hunting park and, and drive the game in a specific way. And it was like this hyper-masculine, it was uh, 
very much common and everyone knew what he was doing. Uh, but whereas Elizabeth might have been a little bit more laid back and kind of waiting for the game to be driven in front of her, uh, he, was, he was out there very aggressively hunting, uh, driving the game. And in fact, he hunted so much that his, his advisors uh, were, were concerned. They're like, you're, you're spending a little bit too much time out in the field and less time governing. And he had to kind of you know, come back at them and say, well, this is what I want to do, I'm king. Specific to James's reign was an institution of regulations on exactly what kind of social status was allowed to hunt par force. Karen, what did James decide were the social requirements for being permitted to hunt in this way? He decided that uh, there needed to be regulations with regards to how much property, how much land they owned, and how, many, how much good or how much money they had. It's, it's really interesting to me because it's like a, hunting laws are like sumptuary laws. And during the time of Elizabeth, it was so common to violate sumptuary laws that Parliament just decided around 1603 to pretty much get rid of them. And then James comes about the same time or a year or so afterwards, and he's like, no, I want you to you know, start these laws uh, regulating who can hunt. So it's, uh, and at the same time, they're, uh, he's giving out these titles, right? The carpet knights. Um, he's doling out these titles, selling titles, uh, which would entitle, in theory, people to go out and hunt this certain way. Uh, but then he's like, no, I'm going to ratchet this down. So it's this bizarre kind of anxiety he's showing about, yes, I'm doling out and selling these titles, but I, I don't want everyone to be doing what I'm doing. He, he, he said, I don't want clowns to have access to my sport. So uh, it was basically, you had to be uh, more wealthy, uh, own a certain amount of land and, and have a certain amount of, of cash on hand. Knowledge of hunting and correct hunting terms shows up in Shakespeare's Love Labors Lost when Holofernes corrects Nathaniel on his identification of a deer. Karen, what does this scene tell us about the importance of being skilled in hunting for someone that wanted to advance their social status? Oh, it shows that it's it's very important to know the, the language. I kind of think of it as a, a shibboleth. If you can't talk the talk, if you can't use the correct French-influenced terms uh, for animals and, and the, the stages of a hunt, then you're clearly showing yourself a, a fool as someone that doesn't belong. And I think it's interesting that it's in Shakespeare. So, you know, Shakespeare's audience would have been at least somewhat familiar with the terms and, and familiar enough to know you know, how he's doing something wrong. And then of course the upper classes would, would clearly be in on the joke and know exactly how that, that person is misusing a term. After someone met the necessary requirements socially, where did someone who wanted to hunt par force go to participate in this sport? Were there specialized locations set aside for this kind of hunting? Yes, there were um, hunting parks owned by the aristocracy. Uh, and again, that uh, being able to own enough land, uh, having the wealth to have the stocked hunting park on your property was very important. Um, so you could host uh, no nobility, uh, these host these uh, grand par force hunts. And it wasn't a, a park in the public sense, it was like an owned private uh, park. I like to think of hunting uh, like golf is today. Um, when people, play golf today, they, they uh, have to be in a club, right? They have to be, have a club membership or know someone who is, they have to be invited. They have to know the language. They have to know how to use the tools of, of golf and they have to know the terms like bogeys and birdies. And uh, I, I see a lot of similarities between the two. And I think a lot of the same things were happening on a golf course in terms of networking. They didn't think of it as networking, of course, in the Renaissance time, but they were making connections and, um, uh, improving their lot in life. When hunting par force specifically, what was the weapon of choice against the animal being hunted? Was it always done in this large group or would individuals go hunting on their own separate from a group? Well, the Grand Royal par force hunt was always done in a, in a large group. Um, and the weapons, it's really interesting that you ask that. Um, some of the contemporary to Elizabeth uh, uh, manuals on hunting don't spend a lot of time talking about weapons. They, they talk about um, the social niceties of the hunt and how to, how to treat the, the most important person in the, in the hunting party. Um, but in general, they were using uh, crossbows and a bow and arrow and, and spear for this hunt. And 
a par force hunt, they were hunting stag, they were hunting deer in large numbers. Now there would of course be smaller hunting parties and they could hunt smaller game, um, rabbits, fox, uh, wolves, um, and then they would use accordingly the, their different sorts of weapons. Uh, but it's, it, it's interesting to me, uh, you ask that question because they don't talk a lot about uh, with the weaponry and the actual kill so much as um, at least these contemporary to Elizabeth uh, books, they, they talk more about the, the social niceties and they do talk about um, the prey and the types of prey, but the actual killing, they don't, it's interesting, they don't spend a lot of time talking about the weaponry. During Shakespeare's lifetime, society saw what Karen calls, quote, permeability, end quote, in social structure, meaning it became possible for individuals to defy the station into which they were born and through knowledge of specialized skills like hunting par force to advance their social status and move into the upper echelons of society. To make this easier to do, specific manuals were written to welcome newcomers to the upper echelons and educate them on the ways of the new social status. These manuals were called treatises and there were several written on hunting. Karen, what were the main manuals someone would reference if they wanted to advance their station through a knowledge of hunting during Shakespeare's lifetime? Well, the, the granddaddy of them all that I think of is the uh, La Libre de Chais, pardon my terrible French, uh, the Book of the Hunt, which was written in uh, about 1389 by uh, Gaston Phoebus, the, the Comte de Foix um, over in, in France. Uh, he called himself uh, Phoebus because he had long blonde hair and he was basically nicknaming himself after Apollo. Um, so it kind of tells you the big personality this guy was. And he was a very well-known hunter uh, and his book is very thorough. He, he talks about all stratuses of hunting, not just the par force hunt, but he talks about hunting for the, the lower classes, hunting with nets, which the nobility would never do, of course. In the Gaston Phoebus uh, manuscript, there's this wonderful scene. Um, it's the Lord of the Hunt. Uh, being brought basically deer poop. No, why is he brought deer poop? <laughs> <laughs> because the way that they would track they would track deer, and one thing they would use is the deer's poop, the spore. And so there's this uh, there's this table spread. He's basically having breakfast outside, and his huntsmen are gathered uh, uh, around him, and there you can see the poop. It's just like these little you know hard deer poops yeah and so i don't know if, if, if there's just any way we could work that in or yeah just, it's just, just like displayed out there on the table and like my lord that's my such lord. a formal i mean i think about hunters they do that you know they look yeah. for scat when they're out not that i'm any expert in hunting i'm totally basing this yeah. off of tv but they look for scat i would just think that's highly formalized like display it here for you let's yeah yeah you can you can clearly see it in the illumination it's like it, uh, there's there's the deer poop right next to someone's oatmeal and so this book uh survived uh as a copy a facsimile and that wound up in the hands of edward uh edward of york who uh wrote his translation which was called the master of game um and the Master of Game is very much uh, based on uh, Gaston Phoebus's book. He eliminates some prey that were not common in France, like rain, I mean, common in England. He eliminates prey that were not common in England, like reindeer. And then he adds a few chapters that were specific to English hunting. And so Master of Game uh, was known and circulated uh, and in time uh, kind of copied, which, which I'll talk about in a couple minutes. Um, after that, well, there was something called the Book of St. Albans. It was published in the uh, late 1400s originally. It's kind of like a commonplace book um, written by a, a woman uh, who was probably a, a prioress at an abbey in St. Albans. Her name was Juliana Berners. Berners? Juliana Berners. Let's just call her Juliana Berners. I like that. I'll go with that. Yeah. Uh, Juliana Berners wrote uh, about uh, the types of falcons. She wrote about uh, hunting with falcons. She wrote about, um, you know, the basics of hunting. Uh, and one of the things that survives in this book is the idea of the collective noun, like a gaggle of geese. Um, she has this whole collection of these, uh, how you would rank and how you would call these different um, 
collections of, of animals. And of course, everyone in England and, and elsewhere in Europe are very concerned about rank. And so this is kind of where the idea of, of ranking uh, uh, animals uh, that are hunted and animals that you hunt with. Um, after that, there comes a, a couple of books that are pretty similar to each other. One uh, called The Noble Art of Venery, which was originally published in 1575 by George Gascon. Uh, he's a really interesting guy. He was constantly trying to ingratiate himself with Elizabeth, uh, but it was a very in-depth hunting manual. Um, and this is where those really interesting woodcuts of Elizabeth come in. And what's also interesting to me is um, when they printed an edition uh, after James took the throne, they cut Elizabeth out of the woodcuts. If you look real carefully, you can see where they, they cut, you can see the line where they cut her out and replaced uh, her with James. But they're doing the exact same thing. They're uh, sitting and enjoying that picnic or they're um, uh, being handed a knife to do the ceremonial cut of the deer, uh, which was the honor of the highest ranking person. Um, so I, I think that's very interesting to me that uh, they just cut her out and it was very thrifty, right? But also interesting because they were doing the same types of hunting. So that's another book that uh, people would be familiar with. It's another Photoshop one, before we had Photoshop. Yeah, yeah, it is interesting. When I was doing my research, I'm like, wait a minute. I've, I've seen this with Elizabeth. What's James doing here? And that's exactly what was happening. It was just another edition of a book, I, I, the book I got my hands on. Um, and another book is by um, Gervais Markham. He wrote a bunch of different uh, hunting and uh, animal husbandry type books. Uh, he wrote so many books that he had to promise the uh, book publishers of London not to write. He got to a certain point and he's like, I promise I will not write any more books because I'm just writing it all down. But that's the cool thing about uh, this era in England, right, is that um, anyone, there's no copyright laws. Uh, you can't stop anyone from uh, copying and publishing things except for Gervais Markham, who just could not stop writing. Who overwhelmed the system. And Yes, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. In her paper, He Cannot Be a Gentleman Which Loveth Not Hawking and Hunting, Karen writes that, quote, poaching was an attractive alternative to dueling, which was also prohibited by law, end quote. Karen, was it James or Elizabeth that placed a law against dueling? And logistically, explain how poaching compared to hunting par force and why would poaching replace the duel? Um, really interesting question. Well, it was illegal, I believe, under both of their reigns. Um, poaching must have been really exciting for the nobility. They're, um, it's kind of like they're insulting the, the person uh, whose lands they're poaching upon. Um, they're, they're probably incorporated a lot of the par force hunt rituals, but they're doing it very sneakily. Um, hunting, uh, poaching was kind of militaristic. It was kind of an activity that, uh, well, you shouldn't really do it, but wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Um, you know, royals will be royals, nobles will do as they see fit. Um, and there's some really specific instances. Um, Elizabeth uh, actually uh, would, participated in a leech one poaching situation um, where uh, someone had been, uh, oh, I think his, someone's uh, brother or sister got uh, executed. And uh, so he was, uh, this family was kind of uh, struggling. And, and so Elizabeth and Lester uh, encroached on their deer park, uh, kind of like an insult, right? Uh, so they went on this hunting foray and they're saying, um, you know, your family's on notice. Um, so poaching could also be uh, like a prelude to a duel. It could be an insult in that like they're, they're insulting each other and it gets to a point where they, be, they, they poach and then they're like, okay, fine, I'm going to duel you. How dare you kill my deer? Um, so it's this very interesting, um, you know, illegal activity of the, of the nobility. Um, they're probably giggling and laughing and thinking about the insult that they're handing out, um, kind of this weird militaristic um, par force hunting uh, on, not on the cheap, but I guess it would be par force hunting um, with a twist, a uh, little bit uh, fast and loose and illegal. 
Karen writes that in a play contemporary to Shakespeare called The Roaring Girl by Thomas Middleton and Thomas Decker, staged around 1607, live water spaniels are called for by the stage direction and that the use of water spaniels specifically was due to regulations from the hunting treatises of the time period. Karen, water spaniels are a type of dog. So were dogs also subject to this social order and ranking for these are the best dogs for hunting? Oh yeah, absolutely. The, uh, the hunting treatises uh, rank and, and compare and list and describe dogs in great detail. And in fact, there was a, a book by a, a gentleman named John Caius. It's probably, it sounds very Latin and probably a, a, um, a pen name. In, 1576, he wrote a treatise called Of English Dogs. This was kind of my gateway into studying hunting treatises. I, I started getting curious about, well, what kind of dogs did they have back then? Uh, you know, we have the AKC, the Kennel Club, we have these fancy, uh, unusual breeds of dogs. What did they have? And, uh, you know, finding out that they had water spaniels was an interesting surprise to me. But they, of course, the highest ranked dog was the one that would, um, pursue and pull down deer. Um, and then after that would be uh, the, the dogs that hunted uh, fowl, waterfowl. Um, and then after that, there would be, uh, you know, lower than that, I guess it'd be the terriers. They don't talk a lot about terriers. Uh, those are more like, I guess, European hunting dogs, or they're described maybe more in the European text, but they definitely, they definitely had rank. Uh, they definitely um, had their own jobs. Um, in, within the hunt, just like, just like the huntsmen, uh, the the dogs have their own jobs, and they were kind of like today. They they had working hunting type dogs. I think I'm disillusioned a little bit that the Irish wolfhound that shows up in the Kevin Costner version of Robin Hood in the poaching scene is not actually what they used to hunt with. I think that should be pointed out because yes. it, that's the film version of poaching in England is always with these giant dogs and water spaniels are actually pretty small. Yeah. Yeah. So they would use, um, they had greyhounds or, or coursing hounds, uh, dogs that hunted by sight. Um, they had uh, scent hounds, what we think of as a blunt hound today, um, dogs that could flush out the prey by, by smelling them, by scenting them out. Uh, and they did have big, they didn't have big dogs like the wolfhound um, as part of the pack. Um, and they would probably be used, you know, they're, the point of the par force hunt is to, they're wearing down the prey. Um, and so they needed a lot of different dogs to, uh, you know, they had different sorts of stamina, you know, uh, greyhounds or similar hounds, um, kind of they're sprinting animals and you would need stronger dogs uh, to kind of bring up the rear. Uh, also, when you, if you're hunting different prey like boar, um, that's where like a, a hound, like an Irish wolfhound would come, would be very handy if you're hunting bear or boar or these bulky type uh, animals that could really hurt you. We've mentioned crossbows and bow and arrow, as well as hawks and dogs to be the weapons we're using for hunting. But Karen, what other forms, methods, or even animals for hunting are outlined in these treatises? We know guns were present in Tudor and Jacobean England, for example, but it doesn't sound like guns were used for hunting yet at this point. Yeah, um, I think this is largely because par force hunting is this um, very elaborate. It comes to us from the medieval period, so it's very um, stratified. It's um, not really, I wouldn't call it a parody of hunting, but it's, um, it's this very elaborate social activity that doesn't really resemble the day-to-day -day hunting that people probably did uh, to put food on the table. Um, so I think that's why there's a, a lack of uh, describing, you know, how to, how to shoot something, how to use the weapon. Uh, and I think they largely stuck to spears, bows, arrows, crossbows, um, you know, these older fashioned uh, weapons. And we know that the guns of the time were very uh, likely to, to blow your own hand off, right? From what my <laughs> understanding is. Not, not um, necessarily practical when chasing a deer. <laughs> sure, exactly. It's easier to go with the simpler stuff. Um, so these hunting manuals, they did, most of their time was spent on this, this higher class, elaborate par force hunting ritual, but they did also spend some time, as I mentioned, the Gaston Phoebus uh, treatise talks about um, 
hunting with nets and traps. And of course, our author Gaston is very clear about you know, looking down his nose at this type of hunting, but he's still, he's just so passionate about hunting that he, um, he, he documents all types of hunting. And he even spent some time talking about the health benefits of hunting, which um, all throughout history, when you read about, when you read these hunting manuals from ancient Greece on, they're talking about, oh, it's good exercise. It helps you train for war. You're out there um, out in nature and you're breathing the fresh air. And it, I think it's, it's very interesting. They have all these justifications for that. So it does describe all different kinds of um, hunting, uh, the, lower, uh, the lower class hunting. Um, and again, prey was very largely stratified. And of course they'd go hunting for rabbit uh, because I guess rabbit is delicious. Um, so or so I'm told. I haven't uh, tried but, it myself, so. Yeah, I, I have not that. either. I, I had a cat that I used to have to uh, buy rabbit for, like frozen frozen cat food Aww. made of rabbit. Uh, so she loved it. Uh, anyhow, um, you know, they would clearly go out uh, on all levels of society. They'd go out hunting rabbit or um, ducks or, or what have you. Um, so they needed to know how to do it. Uh, but 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 clearly the the emphasis is on let's fit in with the nobility. Let's learn how to do this fancy par force hunt. Well, I know we would love to explore this topic further. What are some of your favorite books or resources you can recommend we use to explore this further? So um, there are a lot of copies uh, online of the of Gaston Phoebus's book. It's just so beautifully illustrated. Um, uh, and I linked to that. Um, I sent you the link to, to an online version. You can buy a used copy um, fairly affordably too. It's a it's got an English, uh, I, I wouldn't call it a translation, but uh, it, it does kind of encapsulate uh, Gaston Phoebus's work. So there's also um, Ed, Edwards' uh, book has also been translated um, and that's, a, that's readily available. Uh, you can also find facsimiles of uh, the, the Noble Art of Venery, which is the Elizabethan treatise. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's a bunch of stuff. Also, The Hound and the Hawk is a really good book. Uh, it's very thorough and very enjoyable, a very enjoyable read. We will link to these titles in the show notes for today's episode. So make sure you go there to find those. And it's also useful if some of these Elizabethan and Jacobean words, like Phoebus's last name or the mm. word venery, if you're not used to spelling those, we will have it all spelled properly for you out in the show notes. So you can just click to, to find those. So make sure you go there to see that list. Now, Karen, we ask everyone this next question here at That Shakespeare Life, and that's what's the one book you would take with you on a deserted island? My friends in England tell me I'm supposed to allow you the complete works of Shakespeare and a copy of the Bible. So your choice would be in addition to those. So I'm really behind in reading for pleasure. Um, so I'm going to use this opportunity to get caught up on my pleasure reading and I'm going to read Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. I love that TV show. I've got a copy of the book. I love the idea of mixing Jane Austen's um, social commentary with uh, Tolkien, with magic. I just have not gotten a chance to read this book. So I'm going to think of being stranded on an island as a vacation and I'm going to read that book there you go well that sounds like an excellent selection you'll be nicely set up and using your deserted island time productively I might add yeah getting caught up in that pleasure reading so what's next for you what are you working on now that you're excited about well a lot of my bread and butter is um in managing my university's writing program. Um, I have a PhD in rhetoric and composition. And so a lot of my time, uh, my expertise is used in the teaching of writing and the planning of the teaching of writing. But uh, I'm really interested once again in the idea of sprezzatura, which I, I touch on a little bit in my, my master's thesis. And uh, this is an Italian concept. It's basically the art of making something difficult look easy. Um, and the example, I was watching a TV show recently set in contemporary Venice and this um, nicely, but not overly nicely dressed Italian man. Um, he's on a moving boat. The boat is just barely starting to stop and he just with such grace and ease steps off the boat onto land. And you only notice it, uh, you don't really notice it. That's the thing you don't, unless you start thinking about, hey, that's actually kind of a difficult thing to do. So this is a very Italian notion, right? 
Um, and it shows up, I think, in the, the courtesy books and the hunting manuals and the, the English kind of overlooked it. They translate the, the word differently. They translate the word sprezzatura to be reckless. Uh, and so I'm still very interested in this idea. And I want to I want to start writing. I want to write something more about sprezzatura. Um, another interesting thing about sprezzatura is uh, in Instagram, uh, it's a hashtag, and I think it basically means to people today, you know, being fashionable. So that's a lot for me to unpack. And I, I would I'm, expect it to come with that, you know, I woke up this way. Yeah, yeah, I yeah just, that's exactly the point I, I, I think I'm going to wind up be making. It's just like, um, you know, just kind of shrugging things off and uh, making something difficult look easy. And that's kind of how hunting is supposed to be. You're supposed to be um, gracefully um, jumping on your horse and gracefully following this this deer. It's really so. That's my that's my goal. That's well. My that sounds goal. fascinating. That sounds like a great topic. Karen Kaiser Lee, thank you so much for being here today and going over early modern hunting treatises with us. We have loved taking a look at par force and all the different ways that you can effortlessly hunt deer, boar, and bear. Thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate you being here. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you. Find links to more information on early modern hunting, all packed into the show notes for today's episode. Inside the show notes, you'll find links to the hunting treatises that survive, manuals that you can still read online, along with links to Karen Kaiser Lee and her research. There's also a free history guide on early modern par force hunting, all packed into the show notes. Find that at castycash.com slash episode 156. That's castycash.com slash EP156. That's it for this week. Thank you for being here. I'm Cassidy Cash, and I hope you learn something new about the Bard. I'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to That Shakespeare Life. As always, the best conversations happen after the episode over at CassidyCash.com. Become a part of a vibrant Shakespeare conversation by adding your voice over at the website. Until next time, remember, when you want to know William Shakespeare, you have to go behind the curtain and into That Shakespeare Life.